<laughs> but um, Fresno decided that she would look, she wanted to really nail this, whether this amyloid precursor protein was the cargo receptor that we were so interested in. And so she, here's Fresno, she put peptides on different color beads and injected those into the squid axon and asked, does, does the tail domain of amyloid precursor protein, does that interact with the motors? And I, of course, I would be telling you this if it didn't. And this is one of Preston's videos showing the red, red fluorescent beads, 100 nanometer in diameter, running down the axon or being carried by this motor system down the axon. And here's the squid axon, which is a millimeter in diameter. The big yellow blob is because we also injected green beads that have a jumbled peptide on them. So it has the same composition, but a different sequence as the amyloid precursor protein peptide that we used, and they don't go anywhere. And at higher magnification, I can prove this to you, if I can get it to play, there we go. It, I am playing that video, it's just that nothing's happening. But if we look in the red channel, we can see that in the same axon, we're looking in the same axon in two different color channels, um, we can see that the amyloid precursor protein is carrying the beads, whereas the jumbo peptide doesn't do nothing. So Preston wanted to do some biophysical measurements to see if she could, if this would help her decide what motor, is this a microtubule based motor, kinesin type movement. And these are individual 100 nanometer beads moving um, in, a, in a video captured at one second intervals deep in the squid axon with um, a Zeiss confo laser confocal scanning microscope. In those days, and this was actually 2005, 2006, we still were using manual trackers, and maybe, um, I think I saw Cleve Muller come in, because some people in my lab were trying to use MATLAB to be able to track these things better, and I think that some people at UNM have already succeeded in developing MATLAB program that will track these in a very accurate way. This was done by pressing and putting a plastic, a piece of plastic over the screen and tracing where the beads went by hand. So, how does this work in the brain? And so the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about um, magnetic resonance imaging. And this is the wonderful 11.7 Tesla magnet, Brooker magnet at Caltech. And this is Russ Jacobs' lab in the Biological Imaging Center that Scott Fraser is director of um, in the Beckman Institute at Caltech. And this is Mike Tiska, a physicist who helped me get started on this project. Um, this, this magnet has a very narrow bore. A human wouldn't go in there and get their brain analyzed. It's way too small for us to fit into. But we can fit mice in there, and so we can look at the mouse brain and understand how it works. There's a drawback using the magnet to study how brains react to, to sound, though, and that's this. It's very, it's very weak right now, but when you're inside the magnet, it's deafening. This is what the magnet sounds like when it's imaging. And here's another one that Russ. How many of you have had MRI? So how many of you know, recognize the sound? <laughs> it's, not, it's not very loud the way it's being played right now. But that's um, what it sounds like. This is Shelly Jang, who um, has done most of the actual hands-on parts of these experiments. And Russ Jacobs, who's sitting in the audience, um, and is here, and this is where he probably would rather be, sitting on the top of the mountain. <laughs> so um, I went to Caltech in 2004, and have been collaborating with Russ ever, ever since on how um, tracing pathways in the mouse brain. Um, this is, one of these is a mouse brain, and this was a presidential debate a few years ago. <laughs> um, who votes that this is the mouse brain? All in favor? What is it? It's a chickpea. It's a chickpea. The mouse brain is like a centimeter, half a, half, a little bit more than half an inch in diameter. This is the mouse brain. So we have a problem because MR and, and, and Dr. Fraser, Scott Fraser alluded to this last night in his talk. When we do clinical MRIs, we, our resolution is in the millimeter centimeter range. And when we were using 1.5 Tesla magnets, which are tenfold less strong than the one I'm using um, at Caltech, we get one centimeter um, resolution in our rapid um, human scans. A single cell is, is tens of microns in diameter, so the magnet is seeing thousands of cells. If we want to look at how single neurons work, this is probably not the way to go. 
But this gives us a meta idea. We look at single cells when we do microscopy, and we, we look at whole organ, organs when we do gross examination, and we can do some meta, mid-level examination using magnetic resonance imaging. And um, uh, the, Russ Jacobs prepared this slide and gave it to me uh, several years ago. But the problem here is one of, of the signal to noise. And if we don't have a very high B field, which is the name we use for magnetic force, we can't get enough of the water molecules to tip so that they emit a signal, the radio frequency signal. So we have to go to very high B force if we want to get really good resolution. <coughs> We're still not down to a single cell resolution with the magnet. I've told you about labeling cargo, and I've shown you labeling the virus, I've shown you beads, I've shown you labeling the virus with green fluorescent protein and cells, cellular membranes with red fluorescent protein. We needed a, some kind of contrast agent for the magnet. And the kind of contrast agents you use for, the, for magnetic resonance are agents that are paramagnetic. So one of them is called gadolinium, it's a metal. And another is called manganese, which is a, another ion. Manganese is a, um, a divalent cation, and it is paramagnetic, and it increases the T1 intensity in magnetic resonance imaging. We've spent a lot of time figuring out how man manganese works inside neurons. It gets taken up in those same organelles that I showed you that kinesin carries. And it looks like when we knock out kinesin, manganese doesn't travel well. So we think that manganese is inside an organelle, that is connected to kinesin and travels within this organelle. So that means that we can use the manganese to study how APP carries organelles inside the brain. The first study we did was to look at the hippocampus to forebrain, basal forebrain. This is a very important memory circuit for consolidation of memory. We inject manganese into the hippocampus and then we watch it travel to the forebrain. Um, we had to set up this microscope system in order to do very accurate injections because the mouse brain is so small and we, have, we wanted to do multiple mice injected in exactly the same spot so that we could increase our signal to noise ratio uh, and get a better um, understanding of where, how and where the manganese traveled. And this is just one result from those studies. The yellow is the mouse brain shown in a T1-weighted image of all eight of the mice that we had injected here in the hippocampus. And at six hours, the manganese, shown in this uh, bluish color, had traveled from the hippocampus along <coughs> this structure to the midbrain, or the basal forebrain, where um, memory consolidation would occur. Another very interesting thing that has not been explored very much in psychology is that these two hippocampus are somehow talking to each other. We injected here, but this hippocampus got some of the tracer. That means that there are connections across the brain from the right to the left side of the brain. Let's see. So the first um, problem that we applied this uh, study to was Down syndrome. Because in Down syndrome, um, children have a triplicate of chromosome 21, and chromosome 21 is where APP is encoded, or amyloid precursor protein is encoded. So that Down syndrome people have three copies of the amyloid precursor protein gene, and they have 1.5 amount levels, so they have 50% increase of the amyloid precursor protein gene. And guess what they get? They get Alzheimer's-like senile plaques at age 35. Um, people who don't have genetic susceptibility don't get Alzheimer's plaques till they're 80, 90, 95. So they get very early Alzheimer's plaques. And when we looked at the mouse model of Down syndrome, we found a funny thing. The hippocampus talked more to the, to the, media, to the basal forebrain. We saw better transport, not less transport. And we, we hypothesize now that there's a pruning that needs to happen and that somehow this amyloid precursor protein and the other genes on chromosome 21 are li limiting the amount of pruning that has to happen when neurons learn. 
Now I'm going to tell you the very last thing, and I can see that you're all still awake, so that's really good. Um, the very last thing is a very curious and wonderful story. This is the story of Phineas Gage. Have any of you heard about Phineas Gage? Yes, okay, in your psych classes, what happened to Phineas Gage? Well, he was a railway man, and at age 25, he had this long pole. This is actually a picture of Phineas Gage, which was discovered in 2009. He had this long iron rod, and he was blowing up rocks in order to help the railroad men plant the track, and he jammed this long rod into a hole that had explosive in it, the explosive went off, and the rod went through his brain. It went up through underneath his eye here, and through his forebrain, the, the forebrain. This is the cortex. Here's the rest of his brain. So uh, he walked away from this accident. It didn't knock him out. They took him on an ox cart to the local doctor. The local doctor stitched him up. The, the metal rod had actually flown 25 feet beyond him. It went all the way through, and he had, so one of his friends went and picked it up, and they took that to the doctor, too, so the doctor could see what had happened to him. He stayed awake. He lived about 20 years after that. He died in 1868, something like that. Um, with this injury, healed up. So people have thought, this part of the brain must be worthless. <laughs> must be anything there. <laughs> what do we need it for? And after that, people started realizing that this fore, the forebrain here might serve executive functions. So after Phineas Gage's accident, he had a hard time making decisions. He ended up going to Chile and um, driving a stagecoach for a while. And then he went back home, and he died having epilept epileptic seizures, probably because of the way the healing had happened in his brain. So people have started focusing on the forebrain, and gradually we've discovered from this accident, we learned a lot. This uh, Phineas Gage's brain is in a museum at Harvard. They, they made a plaster cast of his face, and his skull has been preserved at Harvard. Um, and you can actually go see it behind glass. So people have been decide, uh, scientists have been looking at what does this for frontal cortex do? What does this forebrain do? And it connects into the limbic system that I was talking about when I told you about music and how music is causing us uh, to have emotional reactions. And so this is a human brain, and this is a diagram that Russ Jacobs did that we published in our paper, I think in 2009, of what the limbic system is like in a mouse. So this is the mouse's olfactory bulb, which is very big in a mouse and very big, small in us. And here's the prefrontal cortex in the mouse. And what we did is inject our manganese in the prefrontal cortex and ask, how does the manganese travel? What are the circuits that come from this prefrontal cortex into the mouse brain? And this is the result of that. And we looked at two different um, genotypes of my mice. This mouse is wild type. It's normal. And this mouse is knocked out in a receptor for cocaine, one of the receptors for cocaine, the serotonin transporter. It's also the, recept the um, most significant receptor involved in depression. And what we see is that there's a very different circuitry in the two, in the two animals. And actually, it's not two animals. I'm going to go. In the, in the um, wild type animal, we see the circuitry that's uh, um, highlighted in blue here. Most of the prefrontal cortex is talking to the thalamus and from there into some of those subthalamic nuclei. Whereas in the mouse that's on cocaine, because cocaine stops the functioning of this transporter and we knocked it out, the mouse that's on cocaine, the circuitry is much more, um, much bigger, much longer. It goes way back into the brainstem and it goes from the frontal cortex back up into other parts of the cortex and down into the acetabulum. So people call this the um, reward circuitry, and we think this is also the circuitry that gives us pleasure and pain.